this week, a dark moment of an already dark conflict. I started my coverage in April 1861 with the firing on Fort Sumter. Still, to many, the conflict started five years earlier, in May 1856, with the sacking of Lawrence, Kansas, which created the predecessor of the Civil War, Bleeding Kansas. I'm afraid we will turn our heads again to that city for a massacre this week. Captain William Quantrill has been a die-in-the-cotton slave supporter for a long time. He has been on the border between Kansas and Missouri since greeting Kansas. In 1861, Senator James H. Lane of Kansas and a Union general sacked Osella, resulting in the death of nine men who were given a drumhead trial. Quantrill was offended by the sack and wanted revenge. But why Lawrence? One, it's the leading site of abolitionism in Kansas. Two, it's where Senator Lane lives. Three, he used to live there. Third General Thomas Ewing Jr., the Union commanding general in the area, issued General Order Number 10, which would imprison anyone giving aid to the Confederacy. Reasonable enough, but those who are assisting are those not enlisted, so women and children are thrown into jail. The jail building on the 13th collapsed, killing four girls. I do mean girls, under 20, one only 15 years old, and a cousin to Bloody Bill Anderson, one of Quantrill's men. On August 21st, Captain Quantrill and his raiders, numbering 400 to 450 men, begin their descent into the city. 5 a.m., they see a dark figure, and they open fire, killing Reverend Snyder, a lieutenant of the 2nd Kansas Colored Regiment. Quantrill focuses his force on a hotel he soon takes over and has it act as an HQ, while his men break into small groups and begin plundering the town. They burn down buildings, kill civilians, take money and valuables, and try to purge abolitionists. On the top of the list is Senator Lane, home during a recess from Congress. He runs into a cornfield wearing a nightshirt. His political allies also try to escape. While they do, their families aren't spared. His newspaper manager lost two of his three sons. Then there is former Governor Charles L. Robinson, not an ally of Lane, but an abolitionist, who is also on the death list. Ex-Governor Charles Robinson was an object of special search among them. He was one of the men they particularly wanted. When they were in town, he was in his large stone barn on the hillside. He had just gone to the barn to get his team to drive out into the country when he saw them come in and make their first charge. He quit to remain where he was. The barn overlooked the whole town. He saw the affair from beginning to end. Gangs of raiders came by several times, looked at the barn, and went round it. It looked so much like a fort that they kept out of range. Raiders demand their political enemies, force women to make food at gunpoint, and God knows what else. Bloody Bill Anderson captures men and burns them alive. He promises safety and executes once all surrender. He kills children, some as young as 10. And when people try to treat the wounded, they are executed at point-blank range. They comply with demands for money or water. You would have a revolver bullet lodged in your stomach. The men go to Lane's house and ask his wife if they can see him with sadistic sarcasm. To keep up the evil order of politeness, Miss Lane tells him that he isn't home. They break into the house, steal what they want, and burn it down. Quantrill tips his hat. He wished her to give his compliments to General Lane and tell him he would have been very glad to meet him. Mr. Lane would be no less glad to meet him under different circumstances, but it was not convenient that morning. Lawrence suffered 1 million to 1.5 million in damages, with most of it being burnt down. One raider was killed, and anywhere from 160 to 190 civilians were killed, with 30 wounded. The brutality of that statistic is astounding. In any legal battle, those wounded usually outnumber the dead two to one at least. The dead never outnumber the living five or six to one. The men of Quantrill came not to do battle, but to call. 20% of the population of Lawrence is dead. 85 widows will cry themselves to sleep tonight. The question is how? How was this allowed to happen? How could 450 ruffians just destroy a major city? Who let this happen? Survivor's anger turns to General Ewing. He is supposed to protect us, and it's his responsibility. To solidify his power in the region, on the 25th, he releases the sequel to General Order No. 10. General Order No. 11, Headquarters, District of the Border, Kansas City, August 25th, 1863. First, all persons living in Jackson, Cass, and Bates Counties, Missouri, that part of Vernon included in this district, except those living with 
one mile the limits of independence hickman mills pleasant hill and harrisonville and except those in the part of cog township jackson county north of brush creek west of big blue are hereby ordered to move from their present place of residence within 15 days from the date hereof by order for general ewing h hannah's adjutant general this order creates the burnt district as it has come to be known creation of the burnt district caused an uneasy peace as the barren area was impossible for neither anti-slavery jayhawker nor pro-slavery bushwhacker to move to and from Kansas and Missouri quickly. Let's go back now. Two other actions happened on the 21st. There's action by Chattanooga. After the failure at Gettysburg, there was a transfer and promotion. Lieutenant General Daniel Harvey Hill left the Army of Northern Virginia. He headed towards an old friend, General Braxton Bragg, who he had worked for during the Mexican War. He replaces Lieutenant General William J. Hardy, who has spent his entire command arguing with General Braxton Bragg. This all corresponds with Major General William S. Roosecrans' advance. Roosecrans wishes to take the city of Chattanooga, and you'll never guess who controls that area. Yes, General D.H. Hill. Roosecrans sends Colonel John T. Wilder and his Lightning Brigade, the 1st Brigade of the 4th Division of the 14th Corps, to take control of the area. They reach northeast of Chattanooga and begin a terrifying bombardment of Hill's Corps, which is in for Sunday church services. The shells hit randomly, causing panic among the city's inhabitants. The general anxiety is exacerbated when two seamers are sunk. For the rest of the week, the bombardment continues, scaring General Bragg. The rest of Bruce Cran's force crosses the Tennessee River to the south and the west of Chattanooga. Then the final action on the 21st, Charleston, South Carolina. Major General Quincy A. Gilmore commands the Union's 10th Corps and has laid the capital of secession to siege. He gives his demands to General P.G.T. Beauregard, the complete evacuation from Fort Wagner and Fort Sumter, which would undoubtedly lead to the city's surrender. Beauregard refuses. The terms end upon the refusal, the Union moves. Colonel George B. Dandy leads the 100th New York and charges the rifle pits before Fort Wagner. He takes them and establishes a picket line. General Johnson Haggood, commanding the fort, counterattacks and begins digging in. The 10th Corps can't allow this, but the sun sets before they can move. On the 22nd, the Swamp Angel opens fire on Charleston, using the steeple of St. Michael's Church to aim the guns. The rebels can't return fire. They have no way to stop the bombardment by military means. But what about morals? General Beauregard writes to General Gilmore about the inhumane and illegal bombardment of civilians. Gilmore allows the evacuation of the citizens, but reminds Beauregard that Charleston has a significant number of military targets, with it holding a considerable number of ammunition depots. This is the first time a primary civilian target has been bombarded during this war. Therefore, the legality of its actions has not yet been established. For a conventional war, it is legal, with the city being fortified, time being given for evacuation, and the supplies within its borders. A few shots later, the Swamp Angel's barrel bursts. But the other guns continue the bombardment. On the 23rd, Fort Sumter, the first battlefield, was turned to rubble. Fort Sumter is a shapeless and harmless mass of ruin. The fort is still out of the Union's control, but its guns are removed from the fortifications. What are the other fort? General Haggard has been trying to reinforce and strengthen the rifle pits before Fort Wagner. General Gilmore doesn't want this at all, and orders General Alfred H. Terry to use his division to take those forward positions. General Terry orders General Thomas G. Stevenson and his brigade to do the deadly deed. The 24th Massachusetts will lead the assault, supported by the 3rd New Hampshire. Their goal, to take the pits and dig in. For the dig-in part of the order to be fulfilled, the 24th is issued two shovels to accomplish the task. The evening of the 25th comes, and the men of the 24th and 3rd ready their lines. The multi-barreled Reka guns open fire, giving covering fire as the two regiments burst forward, charging the enemy. The Confederates ordered a counterattack, but the 24th already began using their shovels. 
and the Union captain's position. Stevenson leads the charge with a sword drawn and approaches the rifle pits, occupied by the 61st North Carolina. The Tar Heels ready their muskets to open fire on the oncoming charge, but seeing the numbers under Stevenson, throw down their weapons and surrender. Do you think we're done? Oh no, my friends. Remember how Little Rock was taken? Well, it's back in Confederate hands. It seems that the small number of men who first secured it wasn't enough. Either that or the reports were inaccurate, or they withdrew under threat. Major General Frederick Steele is a Union commander and wants to take Little Rock permanently. He has the Army of Arkansas to do so. On the 25th, a brigade of his skirmishes with Confederates, causing no casualties on either side. On the 27th, he suffers 45 casualties in a loss. There isn't much to say about these actions. The National Park Service, whatever that is, has a lengthy description of the entire campaign. Still, for the battles, it's gossip. Is that the end of the week? No! General William Avril raged with a force of 1,300 men, destroying train tracks, a lead mine, and saltpeter works. He closes in on his final target, a law library. I don't know why he wants those books. Colonel George S. Patton of the Confederacy outnumbers Avril by 1,000 men, prepares a defense of the library. From the 26th to the 27th, both sides charge, counter charge, and open fire. It's one giant mess. But in the end, Patton orders a bayonet charge that forces Avril to withdraw. The Union lost 26 dead, 125 wounded, and 67 missing, for 218. The rebels suffered 20 killed, 129 wounded, and 13 missing, for 162 total. Then there is Sickles. He begins to lose hope in returning to the Army of the Potomac. But why not a different command? There are rumors and gossip that Secretary of War Edwin Stanton is putting together a column for a Texas reclamation, and Sickles writes to him showing interest in any possible organization the expedition would require. I hope he gets it soon. Sickles Hour might be dead if he doesn't return to command. That's where the week ends, with action at both starts of the Civil War. To those in the South, the rape of William Quantrill is comparable to General Gilmore. But it isn't. The conflict is thought of as being fought on the battlefield, with armies exchanging volleys. Quantrill took it to the streets and homes on a scale no one had seen before, and hopefully will never be seen again. Quantrill gave his men lists of people to find and kill. His violence was premeditated and done with brutality. But the death list didn't limit the carnage. The horror of this war has shown the legalization of bandits, rapists, and murderers. Hello, it's the entire Civil War Week by Week team here. Sorry for this short video. I remember the first time I had one of those do nothing weeks. I already just told everyone to go home. And someone said, you should have done more with it. And I've tried to do that ever since, but with the recent big battles, it's been pretty tiring and I'm about to move into college. Is that enough excuses? I think that's enough excuses.